Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so as Tom said, I was here last year for a few months and I spoke a bit about some otter work. Um, but now I'm back, yeah, doing a postdoc, looking at the big wolf data set and trying to link it to skull morphology. But I thought it might be a bit more interesting to talk about um, some of my PhD work for now, since the postdoc was the very early days. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the last chapter um, of my thesis. Um, yeah, it's probably a distant memory, but last year I spoke about some of the findings we had about otters in the UK. Um, and there's sort of two main taken messages from this were that we have um, very different results when we use these sort of like established uh, genetic tools uh, compared to when we start to use genomics. And one of the results was that we found this uh, sort of signals of a very divergent lineage in one part of the UK. Um, and we think this is linked to gene flow from Asia. Um, one of these sort of examples is this very sort of divergent whole mitochondrial lineage that we found just in one part. Um, and we dated this and it's about 8,000 uh, yeah, 8, years apart. So this is quite a lot of sort of uh, dis like divergence between these two groups. Um, yeah, and so that work was published at the end of last year. And if you're interested in any more about that, like feel free to come and speak to me. Um, but one of the things I sort of said at the end of that was that we're doing this sort of range wide sampling to try and dig into this question a little bit more. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So we had a few aims of this project. One of them was that we wanted to look at um, genetic diversity and population structure. Importantly, we wanted to do this across this really large species distribution. So that's in the like orangey, ready ash color. Um, we also wanted to have a look at if there are any barriers and corridors to migration for the species. Um, recently, in particularly in Western Europe, there was a big population crash, and in many cases a sort of sharp bottleneck in recovery, but in many cases not not so much. And this has had like quite a few impacts um, on the distribution, but the biggest one is shown in the black arrow on the left, and this is basically where the populations haven't recovered to the point where we have this big gap in the species distribution. So we wanted to um, try and understand if that's left a sort of genomic mark um, on the species in this area. And then lastly, we wanted to have a look at these uh, mitochondrial lineages. So where are they found? How common are they? One of the big questions of this is that we find this very divergent lineage in the UK, but maybe it's found all across Europe. Nobody sampled, so nobody knows. Um, it's otherwise only been found in Asia, but we wanted to kind of look into that a bit more. Um, and yeah, so this is our... It's broken. Yes. We need to take the slide away. Okay. Yeah, so this is our um, sample distribution. We had just over 60 samples of like uh, reasonably high depth se sequencing and then over 100 mitochondrial genomes. Um, the samples are all sort of color coded and all the results, everything that I'll show you from now will be the same colors and everything will go from uh, west to east. So all the results will be presented the same way throughout. So the first sort of result, oh, it's not working. <laughs> um, the first result we had was just looking at genetic diversity. And this is, I think, quite a nice sort of visualization of this and that basically we just get really, really low genetic diversity all across Western Europe compared to um, much higher genetic diversity, even in the very few samples that we have from Asia. Um, we had a closer look at this, so we looked at heterozygosity and nucleotide diversity, and again, these are all sorted from Ireland and Portugal in the west through to South Korea in the east, um, and this is a statistically significant um, trend that we see from low in the west to high in the east, and it holds across nucleotide diversity and heterozygosity. However, when we have a look at inbreeding, we don't see this trend at all, so we find pockets of really high inbreeding right across the species distribution, and we think this is um, coming from like really localized anthropogenic pressures. So for example, in China, there's a lot of um, habitat loss um, and that's leading to isolated pockets of high inbreeding. Um, whereas in uh, Italy, there's been a much slower recovery from these um, chemical contamination and the bioaccumulation losses. So in that case, you still have very slow, uh, small and isolated pockets, but for a different sort of reason. We then had a look at uh, population structuring and the most distinct sample in the data set is this one down here from China. Um, and that is uh, the only sample in the data set that's from a different subspecies. So in a way that kind of supports the subspecies in this one context, but that's, I guess, a whole other question. And then otherwise we see um, almost like a pattern of isolation by distance in the remaining samples um, on PC2. So we have a cluster of samples from Western Europe, <coughs> sample from 
central Russia, eastern Russia, and then South Korea. And this is a similar pattern when we look at the nib joining tree and also the um, admixture analyses. So we have a sort of Asian cluster, European cluster, and then the two Russian samples as sort of like a mixture of the two. When we take out the samples from Asia and run the PCA again, we see this very strange signal here. This is a um, very similar pattern to what we see when we just do this analysis on um, samples from Britain. And we think this is, these are all samples in the circle are samples from the east of England where we think this Asian uh, gene flow occurred. Um, and so there's more variation within the samples just in the east of England. We thought previously relative to all the variation that we see in Britain, but now when we include samples from all across Western Europe, there's still more variation in three samples in the east of England. So a very strong signal that we're detecting, even though we've now um, <coughs> increased our sampling a lot. Then we wanted to have a look at uh, the sort of barriers and corridors to gene flow. Um, the biggest one over here, so this is the full data set, um, is around the samples um, in Korea. Unfortunately, our sampling is just too limited in this area to really do, like understand what's going on. But when we subset it to uh, the sort of more densely uh, sampled region in the west of Europe, we see barriers that kind of match marine barriers. So that's perhaps nothing too new, um, but we don't see any big corridors of gene flow. Uh, for the species range. We also don't see a barrier across Central Europe where the, um, there was that gap in the distribution that I mentioned earlier. So that's perhaps a good sign, um, but we're also not seeing a lot of migration uh, for the species. We then had a closer look at gene flow um, and one of the questions we wanted to answer in here is could we detect any uh, signal of gene flow from any of the Asian samples into the east of England? So we split off the eastern samples from the rest of Britain and then ran um, F3 statistics for all trio combinations of populations. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we do see a fair amount of gene flow, but pretty much all of these are um, across neighboring countries. So we're just finding out that political borders don't really mean much to otters, which again isn't a huge surprise. Uh, but notably, we don't find any uh, signal of gene flow from any of our Asian samples into the east of Britain in this data set. One of the important things to sort of mention is that all of the um, anecdotal and uh, other evidence that we have for this gene flow um, suggests that these are two otters from Thailand and we also don't have samples from Thailand in this data set so perhaps we're looking for a difficult signal anyway. Um, yeah and then lastly we had a look at these mitochondrial lineages that I mentioned before and pretty much all of our data go into this one mitochondrial lineage that's found across the bulk of the range. This other lineage in red is this sort of divergent one that we found in Britain um, and when we plot it on a map Basically, everything except for our samples in the east of England follow the same lineage. Um, and lineage three, the lineage one, the divergent lineage, is only otherwise still only found in Asia. So that kind of supports this theory that there has been gene flow from Asia to the east of England. So to briefly conclude, we see this longitudinal pattern in diversity, but inbreeding doesn't follow this pattern. Um, we also see very, very low mitochondrial diversity across all of uh, Europe, and we don't have any evidence for this sort of Asian gene flow at the moment. Um, but there's lots more things we could do to try and answer that question. Um, yeah, and lots of people to thank for um, the sampling and the funding and things in part of this project. So, yeah.